Final Fantasy VII is probably the most overrated game in the franchise. Is it a good RPG and a good title in the series? Absolutely. Over the years, though, it spawned countless spin-offs, a movie, and numerous ports. Quite frankly, it's become the Nickelback of Final Fantasy, where I have begun to cringe whenever I hear people go on and on about Seven as though no other titles in the franchise existed or that this was the peak of the series. Several years ago, we got Final Fantasy VII Remake, which remade the first portion of the game in Midgar and ended with the team leaving the city. Later, we got Intermission, which covered Yuffie's backstory and how she eventually would seek after the members of Avalanche. This introduced some new mechanics, which were introduced into Rebirth. Still, all of this served to reignite the hype train, and the Final Fantasy VII fanboys and girls raised their voices in excitement to a fever pitch, and my curmudgeonly tendency to be a contrarian resurfaced. This title and all the ports, remakes, and remasters were just becoming excessive, and it was going to become a victim of its own hype. I couldn't wait for the day to see people someday look back at Final Fantasy VII as garbage and act like they never thought it was good, something that has happened off and on with many other games in the series. So when Rebirth was announced, of course I jumped on board like everyone else because for all my annoyances with Final Fantasy VII's popularity, Remake was fun, and so I wanted to continue down the road of this new trilogy. Now, I say all that to say this. After spending a few days with Rebirth, I came to a realization. I was having a blast with Rebirth, and reconnecting with the world of Gaia, seeing the characters interact, and seeing how much more fleshed out their personalities were, experiencing the immersion of exploring the world and seeing the original locations expanded to a much larger degree and interacting with the world's denizens, I felt myself having that same feeling of excitement and enjoyment that I did when I first played the original version a long time ago. And because of that, I had to admit that even though Final Fantasy VII will never be my top game in the series, in honor that will always belong to Final Fantasy VI, it's really hard to argue that the game hasn't earned its accolades and doesn't deserve its position as one of the top games, if not arguably the top game in the franchise. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Today, I'm going to give my thoughts on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which was released this year for the PlayStation 5. It took me a lot longer to get through this game than I expected it would take me, for reasons we'll get into, and while I haven't fully completed everything there is to do, I wanted to talk about my experience with the latest entry in the remake trilogy. The game is absolutely massive, and there's a lot to cover, but I'll try to be as brief as possible. First of all, if you played Remake, there really isn't much different in this game compared to that one. The battle system is largely the same, with the inclusion of the new synergy system and the way that upgrades are handled. Using ATB skills will grant you synergy points, which can be used to perform synergy attacks with other members of your party. Of course, that character also has to use the correct amount of ATB charges in order for that to work, or else the option will be grayed out. However, in the event you're able to pull one off, there are different bonuses you can get, such as temporary unlimited MP, a 3-bar ATB bar, or increasing your limit skill level, just to name a few. In order to stop you from simply spamming these abilities, usually the first use is the cheapest of 3 bars, and then reusing them will require the maximum of 5. Still. As you progress through the game, there are multiple ways of increasing the speed of generating ATB, so this becomes less of an issue. And part of the way you can build up ATB across multiple characters is with certain synergy abilities, such as with Tifa, who can perform combo skills with Cloud or Aerith, which builds her and her partner's gauges simultaneously. Most characters have some sort of synergy with at least a couple other characters, so mixing and matching usually isn't a problem, though some skills are easier to pull off and build charges faster. Other than that, the battle system remains the same as the previous entry, so learning this new mechanic isn't altogether that difficult. Also the same as Remake is how Materia works, and that parties outside of combat will still gain AP for mastering Materia. Unlike Remake, and unlike the original game, Mastered Materia no longer births new Materia upon reaching max level. Most of the time, Materia is pretty cheap and available from vending machines at rest stops throughout dungeons. It's also important to try and keep as many varieties of Materia available and equipped across characters at all times, because the game loves doing this thing where it forces you to only use certain characters for certain story beats. This is all fine and dandy, but 
Switching materia between characters is incredibly tedious at times, so having everyone equipped with some viable form of materia, even for just a generic build, is pretty convenient and will save yourself a headache in the long run. This rule of shared AP, however, does not apply to combat simulations, though, so if you're just looking to spam those for leveling AP, keep in mind that only the participating characters will gain points. Normal battles in the story and in the open world will share across all characters, though, so if you want to grind for AP, and there are tons of different guides out there, then this will be helpful for planning out how you want to do that. It would suck to find a good method for doing this, only to find out that not everyone was getting AP like you had hoped. Also, unless they patch it later, retrying a battle with a bunch of enemies will have you keep the XP, but not AP so you won't be able to farm AP that way. Saving and loading before a respawnable battle works, though. Another change in Rebirth is the upgrade system. Weapons are automatically upgraded and given certain weapon abilities to choose from as you level up. SP, once again, is the determining factor, and, like Remake, there is a limited amount you can get just by leveling up. The rest are obtained through manuscripts, which are acquired by completing certain quests and by playing through hard mode. The SP accumulated determines your weapon level and the number of weapon abilities you can assign, but the SP itself is spent in something called the Folio, which lets you learn new synergy abilities, ATB actions, and gain passive buffs to each character. There is also something called the Party Level, which determines just how much of the Folio you have access to at any given time. As your party level increases, so too do the skills available to you. Party level can be affected by a few things, but it's easiest to just do side quests and do whatever's available in a given region at any point in the story. Oh, and speaking of weapons, they can all be found in the open world, so unless you just miss some while exploring and don't feel like backtracking, there's really no reason to spend gold on weapons. Rebirth also introduces a crafting system, which you can use to, well, craft items and some powerful in-game accessories as you go along. Your craftsmanship level will determine what you can craft at any given point, and certain quests will require certain items which you can only craft in this menu. The ingredients are usually found in the open world, though some are required from killing certain types of enemies or even bosses. I managed to craft just about everything without having to do any real grinding. Then again, I really only crafted one of everything, so I wasn't using that many materials throughout the game in the first place. Your mileage may vary. One of the biggest changes with Rebirth is the exploration system. If you've played any number of open world games over the last several years, you'll probably be familiar with this, especially if you've played any of the Assassin's Creed series or Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. As you gain access to a new region, there will be towers available which will then show you various objectives in the region. The number of objectives in each region is the same and they all fall under the same categories which basically just boil down to exploring and killing stuff. Battle challenges require you to fight certain enemies and complete certain objectives in those fights. Exploration can involve locating certain materia springs or locating shrines dedicated to local deities such as Titan, Kajada, Phoenix, and a few others. These latter objectives will give you the option of fully powering up the associated summoning materia, and when you fight them in the simulator, finding all the shrines will allow you to challenge a weaker version of the summon to make the fight easier. There's literally nothing you get special for challenging them at full power, so I went ahead and unlocked everything and curb stomped them to make them realize who they worked for when I called them in battle. After completing all of the battle challenges, there will be a zone boss that unlocks that rewards you with certain crafting materials that are useful for crafting some important late game equipment, particularly on hard mode. Now, before I forget, one type of mission is the Proto Relic mission. Uh, these are quests that flesh out an overarching narrative concerning how all the pieces of armor fit together and how they connect to a fan-favorite dimension-hopping multi-armed swordsman. They're a fun diversion, and I highly recommend finishing this quest chain by the end of the game. Also, even though the Moogle minigame of the Gold Saucer isn't there, the Moogles still play a part in exploration. Each zone has a Moogle shop unlocked by playing a minigame with all the Moogles, which makes me think that Sigurdu and... Final Fantasy XIV may have had the right idea when he wanted to eh, basically commit genocide against the Moogles due to them being so annoying. Speaking of other things to do in the game, there are a decent number of side quests that unlock as you progress through each chapter. Now, if you watched my review of Final Fantasy XVI, you'll recall that side quests were one of the biggest complaints I had about the game. For the most part, they just weren't that interesting, and only later in the game did they become relevant to any significant world building. 
Rebirth does not have this problem. Just about every side quest has some impact on your characters and their relationships to each other, as well as providing some world building. In fact, certain quests in earlier zones have connections to later parts of the game and have some pretty good rewards tied behind them. That's not to say every side quest is equally enjoyable given what you have to do, although usually the ends of the quest are satisfactory. My favorite involves helping a bunch of chickens who have run away return home to their owner, only for the owner to reward you by killing one and turning them into fried chicken. That chicken deserved it, though. Say goodnight, Pippily. Probably the biggest reason that side quests aren't always enjoyable is because of one thing that, unfortunately, really started to sour the game for me. That, of course, is the excessive amount of minigames. Look, if you played the original Final Fantasy VII, you're already aware that it had its own share of minigames to conquer. The worst part of this is that certain minigames, like Fort Condor and Gears and Gambits, both of which are tied to the Proto-Relic exploration missions, unfortunately, suddenly include hard versions of each game you then need to finish for completion. There's also a series of combat challenges also tied to the Proto-Relics that do the same thing. In fact, just about every single minigame in the game has a normal and challenging version. Why? A lot of people ask why. Why treat the customer this way? Why? Because f them, that's why. This is the reason it took me over 120 hours just to beat the base game. I haven't even finished the brutal or legendary combat challenges that Chadley has for you. And by the way, he's back again with an absurd amount of battle challenges. At some point, it went from being a fun diversion to an absolute slog, especially with some mini games being an absolute burden. Remember the pull-up challenge from the first game nobody liked? Well, let's do it again with crunches. I'm gonna fucking shoot up a Walmart! Oh, and let's tie some of it behind yellow and green signals, which, for someone like me who's partially colorblind, I can't tell the difference. I literally had my wife and son call out to me which color it was so I would know which button pressed to do. Then, of course, there's Queen's Blood. Now, don't get me wrong, Final Fantasy has had its share of card games in the past, like Triple Triad and Tetramaster, the former being popular enough to have its own minigame in Final Fantasy XIV. Queen's Blood is actually a lot of fun, I thought, but in order to get everything in the game and complete all side quests, that means you'll need to do this one too and learn how to master the game. I mean, or just look up a guide online for how to build a deck later on. This includes beating certain challenges at the Golden Saucer. Mini game after mini game after mini game just became more trouble than it was worth. If there had only been the normal version of each game, that probably would have been better, but oh no, Square Enix had to really kick you when you're down. Just when you thought you were done with one series, the game says, oh, there's a hard mode version available now. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 I honestly don't think the game would be quite as long without all this unnecessary bullcrap. Why would you say something so controversial yet so brave? One of the few saving graces, however, is the fact that Chocobo Racing is super easy this time around as long as you have the right gear equipped to your bird. Usually, once you get a lead on the other racers and know how the courses are laid out, it's really easy to maintain that lead. The best part is that no Chocobo inbreeding is involved. I know, some purists out there are upset that you don't have to go around catching and breeding Chocobos, but would you really want that on top of the absurd amount of minigames present here? I for one am glad they decided to simplify this, even though I still think they added too much extra stuff. And that of course leads me to one last aspect of the game, the story. If you don't want to hear about any of the story content or what all this game covers, I'll put the timestamps on screen so you know where to skip to, but there will be some spoilers here. So. For those who played the original, Rebirth covers the events of Disc 1, from the time your party arrives in Calm all the way through to the ancient city. The game covers the same major story beats as the original, but the scope of each region is much bigger and the time it takes to complete each zone is stretched out. However, instead of being slowed down by tons of random encounters, 
the pacing is due to dialogue, exploration, and epic boss fights. Admittedly, you could skip exploration for the latter, and the pacing would be much faster. I haven't actually gone through the footage yet to see how much of the game is story content alone compared to all the other content in the game, but I would guess it's probably somewhere around 25-30% to 30 of the actual time it takes to complete everything in the game on normal mode. That's not counting hard mode and redoing quests for manuscripts. Rebirth does a great job of recapturing the magic of major events of the original. The characters you're able to get this time around are the original characters from Remake, Cloud, Tifa, Barrett, and Aerith, along with the addition of Yuffie, Red 13, and Kate Sif, even though it should technically be pronounced as Ketchi due to his Gaelic and Irish roots. Eh. The Nibelheim incident is as poignant as ever, and it feels just a bit more hopeless when you control Cloud since he is severely injured and literally can't do anything to stop what's happening, he just has to watch people get killed in front of him. I do want to briefly touch on just a few moments in the game that I thought hit a little harder in this version, for me at least. Again, most of the story is the same, though if you played Remake, you know there are going to be some bits that are different from the original, but I'm not really going to get into those moments. I'm going to try to keep these events in order as best I can remember them. The first major one that I fell in love with was in Junon, with the military parade. Here, Cloud, Tifa, and Aerith are all involved with the parade minigame from the original, only this time you're tasked with helping get the Midgar 7th Infantry trained and prepared as well. When you win, there's of course a big celebration and the infantry thanks you for your leadership. And following the awards ceremony, there's a confrontation with Rufus and some shenanigans between different branches of the Shinra army. Cloud and company are required to escape Junon with the help of the 7th Infantry, and yes, you are responsible for keeping them alive. However, by this time, the soldiers have become more than just faceless NPCs, and I absolutely wanted to make sure that they all survived to the very end. The fact that Rebirth took these goofy NPCs from the original and made them more human and more relatable and made you want to see them survive shows just how good of a job the devs and story writers did on making sure you realize that not everyone working for Shinra was a douchebag. Honestly, I hope people's theory that these are the same soldiers who ultimately end up serving this crew on the high wind is correct, because I would love to see the bros again. Another great series of events is the events of the Golden Saucer in Coral Prison. Dio was always a bit eccentric in the original, and my goodness, did they ramp him up to 11 here. True, Dio is an over-the-top, muscle-bound beast of a man who makes Lou Ferrigno look like a 98-pound weakling, but it's very clear that he's a genuinely good man with a sense of honor and integrity who gives Cloud and the rest the benefit of the doubt when Barrett is wrongly accused of murder. Speaking of which, the plot with Barrett and Dine is played out very well. I always enjoyed Barrett's backstory and why he had such a gripe with Shinra. There are other glimpses of this event later on in the game, but the voice acting of the people in his hometown and the amount of derision you can hear in their voices to seeing just how broken Dine had become and how the fight between those two men takes place was much more intense here. Again, most of this can be attributed to how well the actors did in communicating Barrett's guilt and remorse, as well as Dine's fragile mental state and his anger at losing everything he held dear. This is one of the story moments I was looking forward to since, in the original, it really helped to humanize Barrett more and create more sympathy for him from the player. Dine, we can go see Marlene right now. Look at me, Barrett. You think I want Marlene to see what her father's become? Stop. With all this goddamn blood on my hands. The next major scene I really enjoyed was really all of the Cosmo Canyon arc. From Red 13 returning home and then dropping the facade of having a deep voice filled with gravitas. Ah. Hey, guys! It's me! Come back! To the planetarium scene, to the moment when Red discovers that his father died a hero. Well, not died exactly, but petrified. I am Nanaki, watcher of Cosmo Canyon. 
and son of Seto. Protector of our veil! All of it hit just as it needed to. Bugenhagen is still an eccentric weirdo, and they did a great job with his character design and his little floating ball. Other little details I thought were very well done were things like the gradual revelation that Cloud's psyche was breaking down, culminating with the events at the Forgotten City and the Black Materia. I also appreciated how the writers made the men in black robes more sympathetic as victims of Hojo's experiments. This includes a subplot with Roche, who was introduced in the first game, and how he too was taken advantage of and ultimately turned into a broken shell of a man. In some cases, the men in robes weren't just nameless, faceless members of Soldier, but characters you had interacted with at some point. Oh, and speaking of Hojo, he's somehow even more detestable than he ever has been, which is an accomplishment, because even in the original, he was a loathsome individual. There are also moments where, as I mentioned in the introduction, the characters are fleshed out a bit more, not even through major story beats, but through casual dialogue which takes place during quests and traveling from point A to point B. There! They blast those baddies into oblivion! And catch us in the crossfire. Uh, okay, what about Tifa? Uh, Thinking naughty thoughts? Oh, shut up. Busted! I thought ninjas were supposed to be silent. Oh, forgive me for interrupting your fantasies. I'll let you get back to being a perv. Tifa, despite being a martial arts prodigy, is shown as having a deep concern and care for Cloud and the others in a way that comes across as gentle. Aerith is still upbeat and positive while clearly struggling with her connection to the Cetra and the burden she feels as the last of her people. Barrett is still the tough, no-nonsense anti-Shinra activist who won't hesitate to blast his way through their minions, but who clearly worries about his daughter Marlene and often rambles on about how much he loves her and wants the best for her, which really goes a long way in showing his fatherly nature. This sort of paternal nature also shows up at times when looking for Cloud or even when he butts heads with Yuffie. Uh, Red 13's personality is flushed out a bit more and we get to see him cut loose in some uh, rather unexpected ways, not the least of which is his voice changing once he returns to Cosmo Canyon, and you realize that, by his species standards, he's just a teenager. Kate Sith at this point is not yet revealed for who he truly is behind the scenes, though one could infer from what is shown, or he just played the original, and does a good job of coming across as the ally yet loyal company man who struggles with this dual identity. Vincent is introduced in much the same way as the original and maintains the same personality. Sid is also introduced, though under somewhat different circumstances. As some have complained that Sid is too nice here and they would have preferred him to just be cursing everyone out all the time. I didn't have that big of a problem with it since <clears throat> if you played the original, you know that the only reason he has such a bad temper is because of what happened to him in Rocket Town. And we don't see him in that area at all, so perhaps those old memories haven't brought out his more curmudgeonly side. Uh, we do know that part of the reason his dreams were shot was because he wasn't willing to risk his partner's life, who it's implied he actually cares for quite deeply. And we see more of that side of him here, especially when he interacts with Aerith and talks about her mother, Ifalna. He certainly isn't a pushover in this one, but we don't see too much of his character to really say much. Either way, as in the original, Sid is still a good man, and I think that's what they really wanted to show first of all. Oh, and Yuffie is, of course, still annoying. To be fair though, even though she's still fairly annoying when going on about Materia, which is all the time. Oh, that means wherever we find Mako, we'll find Materia too! Materia! Biggest freaking Materia ever! Materia! Do they have Materia there? And to secure the Materia we need to... Unless it's Materia, you can count me out. Only because he mentioned Materia. So an ultimate Materia? Don't you think someone responsible like me ought to hang on to that Materia? Hear that black Materia? I'm coming for you. Dream on! That Materia's mine! Why won't you leave us alone? I got a one-track mind. And the train is derailed. She's easily one of the best characters in battle. Yuffie absolutely dominates on the battlefield. Which is convenient, because I'm aware that there are many in the fandom who want Yuffie to dominate them as well, but that's another issue. Just admit it, you're obviously captivated by my bodacious speech bot. 
all your major story beats are still here. The Midgard Sormer is now a major boss fight, the fight against Genova on the ship is epic, and of course there's everyone's favorite beach episode of Costa del Sol, where everyone gets to have their own swimsuit and go to the beach. A lot of fan service available here. You can tell that the artists and developers were really hard while working on this. I mean, they were working while really hard on this bit. Ugh, did it again. The developers made sure everyone enjoyed these outfits in this section of the game. Whew, that was that was rough. All that to say this. The devs know the fan base. Tifa is stacked, that's all. Other characters make a return. Elena is great as one of the Turks, and I enjoyed her work relationship with Rude. Scarlet still gives off her dummy mommy vibe, so all the masochists still have that going for them. Rufus is still as intimidating as ever, and the fight against him is cheap as all get out. Again, and as I've said before, characters like Dio and Bugenhagen are a pleasure to see. All in all, minus some pacing issues with many games, some of which are avoidable while some aren't, the story is just as good as the original, with enough changes to fit the new story path to keep things interesting without completely deviating from the original. One last thing I really enjoyed was at the Golden Saucer, and that was the minigame involving Loveless. It reminded me somewhat of the opera scene from Final Fantasy VI. In the original, you saw playbills for Loveless, but never got to see what it was. And now, you get to experience it and take part in it, and Aerith even has her own musical number in it. I've always liked Aerith, don't get me wrong. I definitely think that Cloud and Tifa belong together. Advent children sort of lean that way too. I've always had a soft spot for Aerith and Rebirth makes her just so much more lovable and endearing than she was originally and her music number here just melted my heart. I also thought to myself, if and when she dies, so help me God, they had better not have this song playing around that scene. Fortunately, they didn't. That's not to say they didn't tie this song in with events surrounding her death in the credits, which didn't surprise me, but at least they spared me that dagger in the heart in the ancient city. Oh yeah, spoiler alert, she dies in this game too. Or does she? There's a lot about the ending and the way the story plays out in this that deviates from the original just as the ending of Remake deviated, and I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. So, where do I stand with all this? Rebirth is a phenomenal game for the most part. The combat system is just as engaging as fun as it was in Remake, and honestly, I would love to see this sort of ATB system get used in other games. I think FF16 was a good attempt at an action RPG, but I really feel like this is the best of both worlds. The soundtrack is incredible as well, and does a great job of adapting the original music to new settings, as well as creating some new renditions with the same lay motifs of the original. One of my favorites is a little song where Yuffie is singing about Materia with her own character theme. I am so, so bored, bored right out of my brain. And the mini games are excessive after a while, and there were times I wanted to call the game Final Fantasy VII Afterbirth because of how sick I was of all of it. However, none of those are strictly necessary for finishing the main story, but if you're going for 100% completion, this is one of the worst ones I've worked towards in a while. I can't tell you whether or not it's worth it to do, since it's not necessarily difficult to accomplish, since there are people who have come up with broken builds for some of the combat challenges, and with enough time and effort you can learn to do the fights. Overall, it's just more time consuming, and I still hate having to go through hard mode to get manuscripts by redoing side quests I've already done. If it weren't for the mini games and some of the unnecessary stuff being locked behind hard mode, I would say the game is basically perfect. The good thing is that once you complete everything, you can just do chapter select and experience the game again without ever having to touch that stuff. I certainly would not recommend trying to 100% a second save file. Overall though, if you love the OG FF7 and you enjoyed Remake and were intrigued by the direction the story was heading, I cannot recommend Rebirth enough. You'll definitely get your money's worth out of it. Again. At this point, I'm at about 130 hours into it and still maxing out materia and prepping for hard mode. 
I'd say going for full completion could easily take between 150 to 200 hours, which is about how much time I've put into some of the Xenoblade Chronicle games to complete those. Oh, and before I forget, once you beat the game, you have access to the play log, which allows you to see what things you have left to do or reattempt in order to get 100% completion, as well as what things you can do to improve your relationship with the other characters. You can also set who you get to go on a date with in chapters 8 and 12, so if you're hell-bent on getting your date with Barrett but missed out on your first playthrough, you can make it happen here. Well, that's gonna be it for me. I may take a break from Rebirth for a little while, or not. I haven't really decided yet since I'm not quite burnt out on it yet. I'm looking forward to Stellar Blade coming out later this month, and if you haven't played the demo, I would highly recommend it to check it out. There's also the upcoming upgraded version of Shin Megami Tensei V. I need to finish the original on Switch, so I'll probably be working through all of that too. I've got some other videos planned in the meantime, which I'll get around to at some point. Uh, between trying to finish Rebirth, work, and studying for certification exams to try and career transition to IT, I'm a bit busy, so I've been unable to do as much as I would like, but I'll get there eventually. In the meantime, you guys take care, and I'll talk to you again. Eventually. Fluffles away, tilde fluffles away, tilde, tilde fluffles away, tilde, tilde fluffles away, tilde.